in our headlines on this Monday afternoon, March 6th. The UN administration will seek to compensate Korean victims of Japan's wartime forced labor through a public foundation funded by private sector companies. Also, the government here is looking to allow people to partake in flexible overtime hours to better promote work productivity and quality family time. And China's National People's Congress began its annual meeting this past Sunday, with authorities setting their growth target for this year on the 5% range. We start with details of the compensation plan shared by the UN administration for Korean victims of Japan's wartime forced labor. And for that, I have our foreign affairs correspondent, Pei Eun-ji, standing by live on the line. So, eun a public foundation, I hear, will be compensating the Korean victims. Tell us more. That's right, Sunny. Foreign Minister Park Jin announced that the South Korean government will compensate the victims using funds procured through a third party, a public foundation called the Foundation for Victims of Forced Mobilization by Imperial Japan. He said the foundation will pay the compensation and interest on the delayed payment to the plaintiffs of the final rulings made in 2018, and that the same foundation will also cover the compensation and interest for the plaintiffs of pending cases if the court rules in their favor. Over four years ago, South Korea's Supreme Court made landmark rulings, ordering two Japanese companies, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and Nippon Steel, to compensate 15 Korean victims of forced labor during Japanese colonial rule. Seoul Foreign Ministry explained that the government came up with a solution as its priority is to arrange the payments as soon as possible, as many victims have already passed away or, or are in their 90s. It also said the solution is aimed at improving relations between the two countries, which have been strained since 2019, when the Japanese government implemented export, rest export restrictions. We hope this solution works as a way to overcome the conflicts between South Korea and Japan and paves the way for a new era. I think this is the last chance to do this. Korean businesses that were beneficiaries of the 1965 treaty that normalized bilateral ties, including POSCO, will be making contributions to the foundation. The Korean government says it has left the door open, though, for Japanese corporations to take part in the future. But it's likely that, Jap that the Japanese firms will not be making contributions to the foundation, insisting all matters were settled under the 1965 treaty. So the victims and the civic groups supporting them have been protesting against the government's plan, saying this issue cannot be resolved without sincere apologies and participation from the Japanese companies. Right, I see. And Inge, in the meantime, what has been the response from neighboring Japan regarding this latest development here? In a press briefing in Japan following South Korea's announcement, Tokyo's foreign minister Hayashi Yoshimasa told reporters that he hopes the solution will further deepen ties between the two countries. He also said South Korea and Japan are important neighbors that need to co cooperate in order to respond to various global issues. That's all I have for now. Back to you, Sunny. All right, NJ, thank you for that coverage. That was our PNG reporting live from the foreign ministry here in capital, Seoul. Over in the U.S., National Security Advisor Kim Sung han is in Washington to address a host of bilateral interests, including a possible visit to the U.S. by President Yoon seok yeol Speaking to reporters on Sunday, Kim also acknowledged that the U.S. CHIPS Act is on the agenda, as pundits here voice concerns over its broader implications on South Korean chip makers. During his five-day visit, Kim will also discuss with relevant U.S. officials efforts to effectively counter North Korea's missile and nuclear threats. He also noted that the U.S. is closely following efforts to compensate Korean victims of Japan's wartime forced labor in anticipation of a stronger trilateral security framework. And the UN administration is seeking to allow for more flexibility in working hours, which it believes will ultimately serve to promote work-life balance. Our Lee Su Jin has details. The South Korean government is aiming to enhance the quality of life for workers and help businesses grow by making changes to the current work system. Finance Minister Chu Kyung-ho led an emergency meeting on Monday to address the revisions. We will focus on making related laws and systems more flexible so that employees can concentrate better when they are working and can rest and use their vacation days more freely as long as there is an agreement between the employee and the management. The government is making changes to the overtime work system which many have criticized due to a labor shortage suffered by smaller firms. 
Under the current rules, the maximum number of working hours is 52 hours per week, including 40 regular hours, with a maximum of 12 overtime hours per week. However, under the proposal, the 52-hour limit would no longer be counted on a weekly basis, with the limit to be calculated on a monthly, quarterly, half-yearly or yearly basis. The nation's selective working hour system could also see changes. Currently, employees at companies where the system is in place can decide the start and end times of their workday, along with the number of hours they work each day, as long as they do not exceed the 52 hours per week limit for a period of one month. The government wants to extend that period from one month to three months to allow for more flexibility. And the plans include further efforts to ensure that workers get enough rest time, with workers able to exchange overtime hours worked for paid leave. The government intends to create a new working hour paradigm that guarantees choice, health and rest in order to meet global standards. The revisions will be submitted to the National Assembly for approval between June and July. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. Findings for February show inflation here accelerated at a slower pace, but authorities remain cautious amid the presence of variables. Our finance ministry correspondent Ireyan explains. Consumer price increases showed signs of slowing in February. Statistics Korea said on Monday that the consumer price index, a key gauge of inflation, jumped 4.8 percent on year last month. It's the first time in 10 months that the figure below 5 percent has been reported. Increases peaked last July, but have started to see a downward trend since then. This month's deceleration was mainly due to a price drop in petroleum products and livestock goods. Prices of petroleum products dropped 1.1 percent compared to the previous year, marking the first time in two years that an on-year decrease has been seen. Prices of livestock goods slipped 2 percent, the first time in more than three years that an on-year drop has been recorded. Meanwhile, processed food prices jumped 10.4 percent, the highest increase since April 2009. Prices of services, including dining out, jumped 5.7 percent on-year, the pace slowing down compared to January. However, public utility costs for electricity, gas and water continued to soar last month. These three utility prices soared 28.4 percent on-year, an all-time high figure since the relevant data was first compiled. Statistics Korea says with the water rates increasing in some cities and provinces, the overall utility price increase rose from the previous month. The official also says despite the slower pace of inflation, the chance of some difficulties later this year remains. As the government forecasted earlier, we expect some challenges in the second half of this year. Sluggish consumption may be one factor, while uncertainties regarding global commodity prices may arise due to China's reopening. Meanwhile, according to Finance Minister Chu kyung ho at a ministerial meeting on Monday, the government is aiming to stabilize the cost of utilities. The freezing of utility costs in the first half of 2023 had already been announced by the government. The Bank of Korea also held a meeting regarding consumer price rises on the same day. A central bank official says consumer prices will see much smaller increases in March, as oil prices were too high for the same period last year. The figure is expected to remain above the government's goal of 2 percent. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. New research findings show Korea's household debt soared in recent years as compared to that of its OECD counterparts. The Korea Economic Research Institute believes household debt from the year 2017 to 2022 surged by some 32 percent, posting almost 2.3 trillion U.S. dollars. This calculation also takes into account the Chonsei deposit, which is a lease arrangement unique to Korea in which the tenant gives the landlord a huge lump sum deposit instead of paying a monthly rent. As of 2021, Korea's household debt to GDP ratio was 105.8 percent, ranking fourth among 31 OECD countries. But Korea has the highest ratio of 156.8 percent once the Chonsei deposit is included. Meanwhile, Korea's foreign exchange reserves fell for the first time in four months amid a stronger U.S. dollar. According to the Bank of Korea on Monday, the country's foreign exchange reserves stood at 425.29 billion U.S. dollars at the end of February. 
That's $4.68 billion down from the month prior and ends an uninterrupted run of increases since last November. The recent decline is being linked to the stronger dollar, reducing the relative dollar value of reserves held in other currencies. This comes after the U.S. dollar index rose around 2.3 percent on month in February. Earnings from Korea's entertainment exports set a fresh high last month, uh, last year that is, amid the popularity of K-pop and K-dramas. Our Lee Seung Jae has the trade figures. From BTS to Blackpink on the K-pop scene, and K-dramas like Extraordinary Eternal Woo and Squid Game, Korea's cultural content has been receiving a ton of love from fans and viewers worldwide. And thanks to this, the Bank of Korea announced Monday that earnings for all Korean entertainment content in 2022 came to 1.72 billion U.S. dollars, up 47.9 percent from the previous year, setting a new record. On the other hand, South Korea's imports of similar content came to just $467 million, up just 9.7 percent from 2021. This means South Korea also saw a record trade surplus in the entertainment content sector, coming in at $1.23 billion. The South Korean entertainment industry has seen a steady increase in earnings since 2014, when it recorded an $80 million profit that rose to $245 million in 2015 and $520 million in 2016, thanks to the Korean wave boom in Southeast Asia and China. However, from 2017 to 2020, the industry saw a dip in profits as China boycotted Korean cultural content in response to the deployment of the THAAD system in South Korea. But thanks to the rise of OTT platforms and the power of social media, the K-content industry saw a huge surge in 2021 and 2022. And seeing the profitability, Netflix has continued to increase the number of Korean shows it plans to release on its platform, announcing plans for 34 shows in 2023 after releasing 25 in 2022. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. China has set a humble growth target of around 5% for this year. Intentions to this end were shared on day one of the annual session of the National People's Congress back on Sunday. Our Lee Kyung Eun has details. China's President Xi Jinping and top officials of the Chinese Communist Party walking into the Great Hall of People in Beijing. The annual National People's Congress kicked off on Sunday, where officials are poised to declare key policies, President Xi's unprecedented third term, and a leadership shakeup. In his final word report, outgoing Premier Li Keqiang stressed the need for economic recovery, expanding consumption and creating jobs, while setting a modest growth projection for this year. The main projected targets for development this year are as follows. GDP growth of around 5 percent, around 12 million new urban jobs, a surveyed urban unemployment rate of around 5.5 percent. The growth target marks the lowest figure set by China since 1991 when the goal was 4.5 percent. This comes after the country's growth fell to 3 percent in 2022 against a projection of 5.5 percent. Despite seemingly slowing growth, China is to increase defense spending this year by 7.2 percent to staggering 230 billion U.S. dollars. That aligns with President Xi's thoughts on enhanced military governance. We should fully implement President Xi's thinking on strengthening the military and the military strategy for the new era. The parliament session runs parallel to the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which together make up the country's biggest annual political event, dubbed the two sessions. They usually last one or two weeks. The biggest item on the agenda is set for Friday. The Congress will vote on President Xi's third term with all eyes on whether he can secure unanimous consent. The next day, Li Chang, the second most powerful person in the party and a close ally of Xi, is due to be confirmed as China's new premier. Young Eun, Arirang News. In other news, the United Nations seals the deal on a critical commitment that will seek to safeguard 30 percent of the biodiversity in the high seas by the year 2030. Our Ian Jin reports. 
A turning point has come for marine life in regions outside national boundaries, in areas known as the high seas. After two weeks of talks in New York, United Nations members have agreed on a unified treaty that will create a new body to manage the conservation of biodiversity across 30 percent of the Earth's seas. The agreement is the first of its kind since the U.N. Convention on the Law of the Sea came into force in 1994, a time well before marine biodiversity was established as a point of concern in terms of environmental protection. The latest move serves as both a historic milestone and a critical commitment in order to achieve the 30 by 30 pledge made by countries at the U.N. Biodiversity Conference in December to protect a third of the sea and its land by 2030. Well, this is a historic milestone past because this is a treaty that will enable uh, protected areas to be created in nearly half the Earth's surface, which you couldn't do before. There was no legal mechanism of creating marine protected areas in what are called areas beyond national jurisdiction. It's a very historic agreement, very exciting, and it will, for the first time, put in place a mechanism for creating these large marine sanctuaries in international waters, which is hugely important because right now only 1% of the high seas is protected within a marine reserve, and we need to get to 30% by 2030. The high seas have long suffered exploitation due to commercial fishing and mining, as well as pollution from chemicals and plastics, which until now required global cooperation for marine sustainability. The treaty will provide a legal framework for establishing marine protected areas called MPAs and to protect against the loss of wildlife. It will establish a conference where parties will meet periodically and enable member states to be held accountable for issues such as governance and biodiversity. A huge achievement on a global front, but conservationists have highlighted some stumbling blocks. One of the biggest being the divide between developing and developed nations and how to fairly implement the treaty. Ian Jin, Arirang News. Korea's Air Force has been granted the top prize at a major Australian air show. According to the Air Force on Sunday, its Black Eagles aerobatic team made history by winning the show's top award, that is, the best overall display. Streaking red and blue across the sky, the team performed 24 highly skilled aerial maneuvers, much to the delight of spectators. Now, this is the team's first participation in the Australian show, but their second year in a row to win the top award at an international air show. Taking off from Australia's Avalon Airport this coming Wednesday, the team will fly through three countries, including Indonesia and the Philippines, before landing home next Monday. And K-pop sensation BTS secured success at the 2023 Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards. Now, the band was named favorite music group for the fourth straight year at an award ceremony in Los Angeles on Saturday, local time. This latest victory means BTS adds to its record number of wins by a music group at the annual Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards with seven trophies thus far. Blackpink, Black Eyed Peas and Imagine Dragons were among seven other nominees in the category. Kids' Choice Award winners are picked by an online public vote. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Malaysia, rescue efforts are underway amid seasonal flooding over the weekend. At least four people have been killed in flooding in the country's southern state of Johor. The flooding has also displaced some 40,000 people who have been relocated to schools, community centers and relief shelters. Residents have also been cautioned against waterborne diseases. The floods come as a result of record monsoon rains as the region was hit by its highest rainfall for a four-day period since 1991. Floods have also affected other less populated regions, prompting further evacuations. Malaysia's monsoon typically starts in October and ends in March, but experts say the wet weather could last until April. Over in Bangladesh, some 12,000 Rohingya refugees have been left homeless after a fire tore through a refugee camp. The fire broke out at the crowded Cox's Bazaar camp on Sunday local time, destroying some 2,000 shelters, including 35 mosques and 21 learning centers. 
Local hospitals, water centers and testing facilities were also affected. No casualties have been reported and the cause of the blaze is being investigated. Fires are not uncommon in such camps, with the Bangladesh Defense Ministry reporting 222 fires in Rohingya camps in 2021 and 2022. Most Rohingya refugees staying in Bangladesh have escaped Myanmar after a military crackdown against the Rohingya ethnic minority. And finally, renowned architect Rafael Vignoli has died at the age of 78. Known for his unique designs, the New York-based architect was responsible for the creation of over 600 buildings around the world. Among some of his most famous designs is the iconic Zhongdo Tower in Seoul. But some designs have sparked controversy, including London's walkie-talkie building, which initially reflected enough sunlight to melt car parts. The architect was also sued by tenants in a Manhattan residential building over creaks and banging noises. Born in Uruguay, Vignoli moved to the Big Apple in 1978, where he founded Rafael Vignoli Architects, a firm with offices in Palo Alto, London, Manchester, Abu Dhabi and Buenos Aires. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Today marks the third spring term, Gyeongchip, and it will feel more like early to mid-April, with afternoon highs going up 7 to 9 degrees higher than seasonal norms. But of course, it's the very unwelcome dust level that will be high all day in central regions, Jeollabukdo and Gwangju, while an ultra-fine dust advisor could be issued during the day. And dryness in the air continues as well. Iso Gangwon-do province is under a dry weather warning with strong wind increasing the risk of fire. Well, yesterday, many parts saw the warmest temperatures of the season so far, and it could be warmer today, hovering 20 degrees Celsius in southern provinces and the east of Gangwon-do province. Mostly sunny skies are blurred with that nasty dust. It's going to be even warmer tomorrow in the capital, topping out at 18 degrees. And the warming trend will continue throughout the week, with spotty rain in the forecast tomorrow at dawn in Gyeonggi-do and Chungcheong-do provinces. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. Well, those are the headlines at this hour, but do stay with us for our panel session coming up right after this break. See you in a bit.